Today I am joined by James Orr. Uh, Dr. James Orr is the Associate Professor of Philosophy of Religion at the Faculty of Divinity at Cambridge. Uh, he holds a PhD and a Master of Philosophy um, of Religion from the University of Cambridge and a BA in Classics from Balliol College, Oxford. He is the UK Chairman of the Edmund Burke Foundation uh, of NatCon fame, uh, a public affairs institute that aims to strengthen the principles of national conservatism in Western and other democratic countries. Welcome, James. Thank you, Alex. It's great to be with you. I'm very glad that uh, you came on. I'm uh, also very glad to be uh, to have been able to participate in NatCon UK, the first edition of NatCon in the UK. And you were kind of the gray eminence behind the whole event. Um, and uh, I'm glad that you were because it, it turned out uh, very well. And I wonder, um, as the organizer of the, the first NatCon event, what your... Um, what you've learned from from organizing this event, not only about the people who take part in national conservatism, because obviously there were a lot of people from abroad, people who have been part of NatCon, like uh, Yoram Hazoni and and kind of the the American branch of all of this, uh, but how um, how it impacted the UK, how it how it how it went, how did you feel that uh, that NatCon landed on uh, on UK shores? Well, thank you, Alex, and thank you for coming to NatCon. I mean, you were I I, I think what twenty weeks pregnant, twenty five weeks pregnant. It was a uh, amazing to to have you there, and really, we were so grateful to you for making making yeah twenty five yeah make, making the trip borderline flyable. <laughs> and seeing as we o we <laughs> opened you. the conference uh, with the theme of. Uh, babies and family formation. It was wonderful to to have you there on that first morning talking, give, giving your superb uh, paper. Um, so, well, lots to say, really. I mean, the conference, the impact of the conference was w well beyond um, my kind of wildest expectations in terms of media impact. Um, I'm an academic. Um, I've been involved in several academic conferences, and and this is obviously this was obviously a completely different. A completely different beast, and so we were all thrilled at uh, the reaction, both the negative reaction, which we anticipated, though probably not quite. I didn't think it was going to be as as uh, wide reaching or as or as vigorous as it was. Um, and it was it was very clarifying. I think uh, it, it really sorted the conservative movement in the UK across all of the sort of standards divisions that we all knew were there, but we started, we really sort of saw the wiring uh, beneath the bonnet of conservatism in the UK, as it were. And, um, and it really, I think, separated out those with more liberal instincts, perhaps more on the sort of left of the party or left of the conservative movement and, and those on the right. Um, and we weren't quite sure how it would land. I mean, I remember going to NatCon, I'm not sure if we met uh, uh, two or three years ago, the one in Rome, I think it was early 2020. Uh, and that, at the time, the the British reaction to that conference, I think a couple of MPs were going, or, or, or there was one MP who who went out there who um, uh, was immediately ostracised for going anywhere near these um, these shady European conservatives. And I was a little bit mystified by the whole thing. I didn't understand why uh, just you know a few days after the. Uh, Brexit Day in Parliament Square. This is the end of January 2020. Why thinking about nationhood and thinking about uh, politics through the the prism of the somewheres rather than the anywheres was was, was such a bad thing? Um, so I'd been tracking it from that point onwards, um, and then Yoram and I started talking about whether or not it'd be a good idea to to try it in the UK. And I was, I think, to begin with, slightly skeptical. Um, but as always with these things, Yoram's instincts were were spot on, and he came over towards the end of last year in the UK and met a few people within the conservative world and did some podcasts. And he said, "Look, I really think this is going to work." And and um, you know, I I we started started planning it. And um, as I said, I think to you know to begin with, we thought that. Um, you know, I, I think I thought of it more as an academic conference. It's just like, let's get all the ideas out there. This is a time, uh, this is almost a sort of end of school feeling. There's a sense, there was a sense, you know, there's still a sense that next year the Conservatives are going to be turfed out after after 14 years. And and we should be, now is the time, the time is right to be thinking about the future of the right um, in, in Britain. And so that's why I think we were a little bit more, 
um, yeah, we, we wanted to, to try out some ideas and give platforms to people who don't typically get to get get to speak uh, within the kind of conservative firmament. I mean, it's a strange setup here in the UK. I know in the US, you have what's it called? Is it CPAC and Turning Point USA? There are all these these enormous sort of conservative summits. and There's a lot of kind of energy at the grassroots and lots of mechanisms for grassroots sentiments and ideas that are sort of bubbling beneath the surface to 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 be given expression. We don't really have any of that in the UK, uh, as far as I can tell. I mean, there's the Conservative Party conference. And you can, if you want, put on meetings on the fringe. And they're literally called, it's literally called the fringe. (laughs) You have to, you're going to have a fringe meeting or a fringe gathering. Uh, And, and, you know, it's very much within the control of the (laughs) Tory party so that, you know, conservatism becomes sort of indelibly associated with the Tory party. Now, that's fine if the Tory party is uh, hewing close to conservative, um, uh, traditional conservative uh, values, but at a time when it's clearly diverging or basically inert, and at a time when there's real frustration in the country at large, um, that the the political party is not giving any expression to to conservative sentiments and conservative, conservative ideas. There's that, that there's a real there's a real problem there. So I think a lot of the the sca- the disproportionate sort of scale of the impact, or certainly the unexpected um, uh, impact, was was partly because it was a sort of release of a, a there was a sort of pressure valve moment really, and it was uh, suddenly there was an opportunity for people to come together and express their disaffection and express their um, uh, uh, new ideas. And so I, I, we were just thrilled at the way it went. And, and I think we filled a, a sort of a, a gap in the landscape. And um, I think there's there's an appetite to, to, to keep it going and to open up a, a distinctively British stream of NatCon. Now that's, that that was um, partly my my impression as well. Um, I think the, uh, the what, what was striking in in the UK case because I've been to to a few of these now and then in the US and in the UK uh, was that there there really was no um, institutional outlet for this. So there, there 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 was no umbrella organization where people who think this way or maybe have ideas that are a bit outside of the Tory mainstream. Um, can express them or find the home or something like that. And it did feel like a bit of a, um, it, it felt like a youth movement as well, because I think one of the, the, the more strange vignettes from, from the event was the, uh, the, the contrast between the protesters outside and the people inside. I mean, there were so many young people and um, there, it's, there, there were seekers. I mean, there are a lot of people who were looking for, answers in a, in a different place, answers that tie directly into their, their life uh, in terms of family formation, how to afford housing, just basic things that were not answered anywhere else. Uh, they found this place and the people outside were, I mean, they were 60, 70, 70 year olds with, um, I don't know, Tory scum posters and uh, I don't know, think, Extinction Rebellion, things like that, that had it really didn't feel had anything to do with the conference. And I, I also think that a lot of people would probably agree with the Tory scum poster sometimes and not necessarily about individuals, but about the, the party in general. Uh, so um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a strange, um, it's a strange time for the so-called new right. I mean, this is probably the the, the third time we call it. We're, we're calling it the new right, but this this one's new. Uh, but it, it, yeah, it's it. That's kind of the the big difference that I saw between America. There, there is no home for it. Not that the U.S. Republican Party represents, you know, the new right in any way, but um, because of the federal structure of the U.S., you do have clusters of. Uh, local or um, statewide Republicans that do represent it a little bit better and are trying to come closer towards this this emerging uh, field. So I think that's probably the, um, the mechanism that allows the U.S. to be a bit more practically oriented, which, you know, I think that's also another thing that I noticed about uh, NatCon UK is that uh, a lot of speeches were very high-minded, very um, kind of academic, very, you know, we'd really like this to happen, uh, especially kind of the, the, the Swella Braverman speech. I was completely, you know, on on her page. I was very interested in what she had to say. 
but it did feel like it was um, almost admitting defeat. Like I'd, I'd really like this to happen, but you know, as someone who is in the higher echelons of power and could probably maybe perchance make it happen, she didn't seem like she actually had the the levers to pull to you know to even reduce immigration or you know that that a, a bit of a sense of powerlessness from the um, from the politicians kind of bled through the the speeches and all of that. It's like okay. We'd like this too. I mean, we're, we're we agree with you people, but you know, <laughs> whatever machinations are in the in the in the background, um, you know, it's it's really hard, and we we can't really do it. So uh, that was a bit um, I don't know. That was a bit discouraging. Just you know, that peek through the uh, the the actual power landscape. Yes, I I noted that too, and you're absolutely right about the protesters. I mean, the protesters was led by a kind of uh, Westminster uh, kind of pantomime character called Steve Bray, who gets paid an awful lot of money to, and in fact, I understand was paid specifically to protest outside the venue for, for three days. And, um, uh, and it, no, it, it, you're right, they were, you know, the average age of the protesters was uh, twice that of the average age of uh, attendees at the, at the conference. I think we had, I worked it out, it was something like just over 40% of, of the thousand people or so who attended were were under thirty. Uh, many of them were uh, students or graduate students uh, from the kind of top universities. Uh, I'd have thought I would have could have done a straw poll, but my sense is a tiny fraction of the people who came were signed up members of the Tory Party, and I doubt if more than half would actually vote Conservative. So. That's, I think, that was an important achievement of the conference. It was to, as it were, break apart this association within the public mind that conservatism is Tories, is is the Tory party, is is the current Tory party, and um, and I, you're right that it, it was quite high minded and theoretical and uh, theory sell, as I think it's called online. But I, I think you know the reason that's partly perhaps because those involved in shaping it were academics, but. I think it's also that it was the sort of structure of, of the conference. That is to say, when you're running a conference that's effectively plenary only, the opportunity for breakout policy workshop type events along the side is is more is is just limited. You can't you can't do it. If we do it again, what I would like to do is have many more uh, workshop type um, uh, events happening a- along the side where. We can really start to get down to brass tacks and think hard about um, uh, the sort of you know nitty gritty policy solutions, and um, that's something you know that that it, the conference itself was a kind of hub uh, for a whole range of different networks of um, of g- groups who have uh, p- partly journalists, um, politicians, uh, policymakers, special advisors who who work on lots of different frontiers of of policy. So a lot of the people who work who've been working hard on the academic freedom legislation that we've just passed here in the UK were there. People working on uh, education, also people coming up with new ideas on migration, family policy. So that was it was there. It was in the air, and it was I, I suppose yes, it was give, being given a more sort of theoretical. Um, uh, uh, a, there was a sort of theoretical profile, as it were, being set out, and I hope next time we we would get more into the more into the detail. Uh, yes, I mean the Home Secretary speech and Suella Braverman. I mean, she was first of all. I mean, it was remarkable she agreed to come and speak. You know, this is an unfamiliar platform, uh, uh, not not a hostile audience, but certainly not an audience that was sympathetic to the Tory party and certainly not an audience that was sympathetic to the Tory party's track record on migration, illegal and legal. And so it, it, we were, I was so grateful to her for coming and I thought she she gave a very good speech. And yeah, there was frustration in the room, of course, and, there was, and, and she herself is frustrated. As, I mean, she's on record as having said that you know her her hands are tied. We still are, you know, despite Brexit, we are on uh, still, as it were, within the jurisdiction of a foreign court in Strasbourg on an issue that really goes right to the heart of of what sovereignty is, namely control of who gets to come into your country, who gets to be part of the national family, and and on what terms. And that's something that that I think you know any pro nation conservative should 
should believe uh, it must must be a matter for the people to decide. And um, you know, Suella is, as all of her predecessors have been since certainly, well, certainly we we were one of the first signatories of the European Convention. But since Blair's Human Rights Act came into force in two thousand. Uh, we, you know, in in effect, sovereignty is is curtailed on on the borders question, and uh, you know, one of the things I, one of the points I made in my speech is that you know, if we really want to take back control, as was promised back in in 2019 or back in 2016, and uh, we need to not just get Brexit done, we need to get Strexit done. That is to say, we need to really be willing to break away. From Strasbourg and trust our own courts and trust Parliament to um, to, to to decide on on the uh, make to devise a migration policy that that works that's fair um, that allows us to be generous and open hearted to refugees as we as we have been in the case of Ukrainian refugees and refugees from Hong Kong and so on um, but uh, that also allows us to give expression in in public policy to the very clear instructions. Of the electorate in in 2019, namely that net migration should should come down. Um, so yes, it, it, it was. I, I, I enjoy. It, it was special having the politicians there because it allowed a kind of interface between um, between a sort of you know loose coalition of small c conservatives and uh, and people who are, are actually in power and trying to trying to get things done and. Um, I thought that was one of the most exciting features of the conference, the, the fusion of those two. It was, there wasn't a sense that it was uh, a kind of uh, an in-house um, Tory uh, uh, sort of, you know, therapy group. Yes, I think that's that's correct, and I think that there's definitely a role for these conferences to to act as a as a scene where where people recognize each other, where they can mingle, where there's kind of a a, a consciousness of the of the whole movement and who it might include. Um, it's yeah, that's that's probably I think one of the the main functions of it. Obviously, the speeches are great, but the the networking aspect of it seems to be it seems to be even more wonderful. And even just the, the people coming up to you and, and talking to you, there's always, um, yeah, not only the graduate students of which we we've already said were, there were many, but uh, all sorts of people working, like you said, in, in policy and academia who are fellow travelers are loosely aligned or already actually doing serious work and 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 trying to make this stuff happen uh, i thought that was yeah for me that was always the, the the most important value add um and uh you you kind of in passing and mentioned the evolution of of conservatism in the uk and the fact that things especially um the this this new freedom of speech act i'm not sure exactly what it's what it's called specifically but it seems to be quite a a change in in, in tone and in 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 the way that people who are um conservative in the uk are comfortable with using power um this is not something that kind of thatcherism or or the, the wider kind of fusionist, Reaganist uh, consensus uh, would instruct us to do. We should be afraid of power. We should kind of de, um, uh, you know, let leave the state, try to disempower the state. Uh, but now it seems like, especially in, in, in the U.S., but now apparently also in the U.K., that power is back in fashion. And I wonder what you make of this change and, and how you feel about mm. it personally. Mm. Well, you, you're absolutely right. It's, it's been one of the key debates, not just within um, British conservatism, but but of course in the US too, and and very much so on the continent. I think on the continent, it's never never really gone away. Uh, yes, I, I think you you know in the heyday of of the nineteen eighties and and sort of in Thatcher's period in power, I think there was a sense that you know deregulation, trying to uh, uh, just sort of you know lighten the legislative load was the kind of the order of the day, um, and and uh, what Blair got right when he came in in ninety seven, what he what he he understood was um, the importance of of power and the importance that the the extent to which law law is a teacher law has enormous downstream effects on both politics and culture and power is 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 upstream of both of those 
and that's a kind of you know tweak to to Breitbart's uh, axiom. And um, Blair's genius was to fundamentally reorganise the landscape of of power uh, a- across the UK by building pieces of infrastructure through legislation that have effectively uh, mean that that the the political landscape landscape is immune to the ballot box. So you saw this with, for example, the Human Rights Act, you see it with, um, to some extent, the Data Protection Act, you see it with the Communications Act, the Constitutional Reform Act. Sorry, these are all pieces of legislation that Blair rushed through very, very quickly, but had the effect of effectively rewiring uh, the, the, the British constitutional machinery in all sorts of significant and crucially irreversible ways. Um, the Equality Act, which, well, there was an earlier version in 2006, 2007, which just was revised in, 2000, in 2010, that in effect has become something like the Civil Rights Act 1964. I mean, it is becoming almost a sort of rival constitutional, uh, uh, constitutional doc- document, a sort of codification of, uh, of a sort of rights-based regime, which is really an alien intrusion uh, into the British context, when you look at the sort of grand sweep of history, it's you know we've we've not really been um, uh, we've not be, been used to thinking about human dignity, rights, and wrongs in in a rights based way. This is effectively a a European or other republican way of 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 thinking about these questions. And um, so so Blair's achievement was to um, make these changes in a way that. Uh, as it were, sort of sapped any kind of subsequent enthusiasm to to exercise power in a meaningful way. So everything is sort of downstream of those fundamental shifts. And so in the last 13 years, I mean, you know, the Conservatives haven't dared tweak the Equality Act. I mean, there have been certain attempts to uh, 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 sort of rebalance the uh, configuration of personnel in the various quangos and sort of quasi-governmental councils and um, uh, sort of commissar bodies uh, that, that the legislation generated. But really, that's had very little effect. The terms are still set by the exercise of, of power in the over from, from 97 to, to uh, 2010. And so th- there have been moments, and I think if the Tories go into opposition next year, as seems likely, I think one of the key questions will be whether they can uh, summon up the courage to introduce the kind of bold legislative changes that would be that would be necessary to to uh, re- kind of re- renew the country in a way that is more consistent with a with a conservative vision. Um, now it's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, the Equality Act, as bad as it is, uh, still you know it it is probably the the best statutory shield for, for example, gender critical feminists at the moment. And so we've had a number of interesting developments in the so-called turf wars, the, the culture wars over gender identity, which, you know, relative to the rest of the West, um, have been really quite encouraging. I think there's a sort of uh, feeling that common sense is, you know, reason is resuming its seat and common sense is is returning a little bit and, and asserting itself and in the gender wars. And that's partly thanks to to the to the Equality Act. So it's a it's a very, very difficult thing to uh to 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 un, unwind and, and unravel. Um the the legislation you referred to is probably, you know, it, it this is a uh, uh, an, an attempt by the government to um, protect, give stronger statutory protections to academic freedom in, in the university. Um, you know, it's still very early days. We're not sure uh, how it's going to work out. Um, but I think it's probably one of the very, very few manifesto commitments from 2019 that the Tories have, have delivered on. And uh, it, it represents, I think, a very significant intervention, statute, sort of uh, in, uh, exercise of power in um, in the culture wars, and I think could be a a useful case study uh, for for the Tories as they, you know, pl- plan plan an attempt to a, a recovery in in opposition. 
So I, I wonder what you think the um, the effect of, of, of status is in, in these cultural wars and in all of these conversations, because it does seem to me like there's um, a bit of a snowballing effect. You see this in, in the U.S. as well. I mean, with all the attacks on um, uh, affirmative action, I mean, how it's going to play out in practice, another question, but all of these things are starting to be hacked at from, from the root, um, abortion as well, uh, all sorts of things that, to, to be honest, if someone told me this five years ago, I, I would have thought, you know, they, they weren't saying that this would, would even be on the table again, but it is. It has all sorts of uh, policy implications that might be or not be favorable for the conservatives in the U.S. But for now, it, there seems to be a concerted effort by organized groups of people, um, some of them quite high status, to revisit some of the, the, the core values of the regime. Um, and I wonder how you see this in the UK, because status in the UK functions a bit differently than in the US. The elite in the UK are actually um, hist historically entrenched there. There is a the class system unlike probably anywhere in the world. Uh, it's, it's quite alien to, to, to outside observers. Uh, it's quite interesting as well. Um, how, how do you see this? Do you see uh, a changing in the ideas that at least a, a part of the elite hold is are the ideas of the of the old money elite or the kind of the the, the upper caste of the the UK unchanged? Um, you know, how how do you see status playing into um, all all of the, the the culture war upheavals that were 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 in, intertwined in? It's a fascinating question. I mean, I think you know, old class status currency is is now really downstream of what uh, Matt Goodwin's called the new elite. And um, the sort of class-based prism is, 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 you know, no longer the right way of, of, of looking at, at British society. I mean, as is the case in the United States, really the, um, the, the elite worldview is, is the, the worldview of the metropolitan uh, global villages. Um, and the various things, factors driving that one is the uh, enormous increase in um, numbers of people going to university, coupled with the fact that you know, our universities are almost entirely uh, residential universities. So you have this uh, effectively 50% of each cohort is now leaving home at 18 and going to the other side of the country for three years after which they almost will will always gravitate to the to the southeast and to London, in in particular, and so that has really you know upset the kind of traditional you know class based sort of um, elite structure and architecture uh, in in all sorts of significant ways. And so if you look at you know um, the uh, traditional sort of uh, uh, elite forming institutions, the, the kind of the classic stables of, you know, the, the, the top universities, um, the top public schools, you know, the, as it were, the, the sort of elite private schools, uh, uh, all of them are, you know, really taking the knee to the grievance industrial complex. Uh, they're all, you know, happily uh, marking uh, marking uh, Pride Month and um, Black History Month and so on and so forth. So the, it, it's very much, we, we are in a sort of, our elites are uh, really echoing um, the kind of cultural neuroses of, uh, of the United States. And this is a point I made in my NatCon speech, I think, or in remark, some of my remarks at some point was that, you know, we, we've regained to some degree political sovereignty from Brussels, but we've surrendered our cultural sovereignty to Washington and Manhattan and Harvard and Silicon Valley. And that is a much, much it's, you know, that's a much, much harder problem to deal with than, um, than leaving the European Union. Uh, this kind of, uh, we, 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 we are badly in need of some decolonizing, um, not but not in the way that most people think. We need to be decolonized from 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 our new colonial overlords in in the United States on on cultural questions, and that's particularly true of you know um, the new elite perspectives on questions like race. Um, I mean, that's not just you know, of course the 
uh, uh, Britain has uh, has not got a perfect record in t- in when it comes to the history of sort of in- interracial relations, but it's it's not bad, and it's certainly better than what they've had in the United States. It's certainly not the same as what there's, uh, they've had in uh, uh, as um, kind of the, the the kind of the neuralgia of, uh, of of the race question in the United States, and um, that. Uh, and yet, you know, within you know, back in the summer of 2020, within within hours of um, George Floyd's death, uh, the UK was kind of racked with this sort of uh, torment and 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 navel gazing about you know what what what's gone wrong, and um, it was it was you know it was extraordinary to see. Um, so you know, in many ways, I think part of the part of the problem that we're dealing with at the moment is that. Elites don't think terribly differently from elites in in the UK. They don't tend to think terribly differently from from elites in 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 America or or, or indeed continental Europe. Yes, I I, I agree with that, and um, I, I do think there is a, a little bit of hopeful movement. Uh, I, I don't know where to place actually the um, the so the the, the striving counter elite that is kind of at the at the at the budding heart of of uh these um these new movements toward the right and toward a you know a more either national conservative right or a religious right or um you know th- th- there's uh d- d- just just knowing a lot of people who've kind of defected from the the new elite because um like like any sort of um elite if it's if it if we're not talking about the people at the very top uh, there is some sort of allegiance forming mechanism that attracts people to the elite. This is, could be either, uh, you know, the the fact that it, it confers status, um, it uh, it confers money, um, it confers uh, opportunities to advance in status, um, and it feels to me like in, in many of these directions, um, the new elite is not doing as well as it used to. Not that it does not still confer status, but uh, the fact that now this is this is the same ideology that the lower middle class has. You know, you hear about the uh, you know the hicklib in uh, in uh, America. These are you know people who uh, are, are in, in southern states and they really play up the woke angle to align with what they think is what what people you know what what the elite believes. And it's it's all starting to have a bit of a whiff of of low status. Um, and I also see a lot of people kind of in the upper echelons um, des- deserting and, and defecting from the new elite because of the fact, partly because of the fact that it's low status, but partly also because, you know, we're at the stage uh, in the cycle where um, you need to profess belief in, in absurdities to be part of the new elite. And some people, maybe some people have a bit more of a, an autistic bent. <laughs> they just they just can't get themselves to do it. Um, so I think that is a little bit of a breaking point. The, the the fact that status is shifting a little bit. You know, if if a truck driver is just as woke and you know ha, has the, the latest upgrade on um, update on whatever um, woke ideology one needs to have at at Cambridge. It's not as interesting. It's not as edgy. So um, yeah, I think I think this could be a, a good direction. I don't know if this applies as much to the UK as it does to the US, but it seems to be something that's that's going on in the background, and it can happen quite fast because information travels much faster than it mm-hmm. used to. So here's hoping. Well, no, I, I mean I I couldn't agree more, Alex. And I think those dynamics are probably right. I mean, uh, up until I think maybe quite recently, that dynamic worked in such a way that you know it accelerated wokeness within the elites. So um, you know the language and the intellect keeps changing, um, and you move from issue to issue, and you get in, in fact you get kind of woker and woker and more and more detached from and, and more and more transgressive, and as it were, as uh, as as the hicklibs sort of catch up, it, there's a sort of pressure to, to keep changing. But yes, I think there is now a, a sense of a kind of ca- countercultural resistance to this. And I think one sees this in the young to some extent. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the belief formation is starting, I think, maybe to tack in a, in a different direction. 
it's hard to track these things because, as you say, it's it's decentralized. It's sort of in the air, and uh, you're probably as well placed as anyone to be, you know, p- picking up the different sort of scents in in the wind. Um, and uh, and and maybe yes, when the end comes, it, it will come very quickly. Um, the, these ideological outlooks are getting increasingly brittle the more detached they become from uh, reality. And we see this particularly in the case of uh, transgenderism. And, you know, I sometimes wonder, you know, I sometimes imagine a kind of dinner party in East Berlin in January 1989 and, you know, somebody turning to to then, you know, uh, the person next to them and saying, you know, in in 10 months, all of this will be over. And... The reaction, you know, I think my reaction would have been, well, "What do you mean? This is just, just unthinkable. What do you mean? It's just going to, it's just going to, you know, finish just, just like that." And and yet it did. Um, and so I think it, it, it's quite possible that think things will, will happen in, in that way. In the UK, there is a sense that the media is um, that sort of ideo- ideological opinion is it, the sort of ideological outlooks are a little bit more dispersed across the media landscape and that there is a sort of an emerging ecosystem of um, YouTubers and Substackers and uh, tweeters and new new platforms opening up that uh, don't tow a regime line and um, and, and, and do have some kind of significant traction um, within the electorate uh, at, at large, and one, you know, I think there are um, that there's a slightly less polarized uh, quality to the to the kind of to the, to the atmosphere here in the UK than than is the case in the United States, um, and and so I think there are signs of, of of things shifting, but at the moment there's also a widespread feeling of political homelessness and a widespread feeling that within you know, within the uh, within the political parties and within the institutions, uh, there is the, the 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 capture is complete, and it's not at all clear how to go about reversing that. Um, it's it's you know the paradox for conservatives, particularly in in the UK, is that there's an instinct to conserve institutions, uh, but right now that means conserving capture. Um, and you know it's it's very very difficult for a conservative to even contemplate uh, scrapping the BBC license fee or questioning the BBC's charter, uh, even as it becomes clearer and clearer that the BBC is is tacking more and more in a kind of progressive um, global villager direction. Um, but it, you know it would take it would take a reactionary. Really, within the Conservative Party, to 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 break through, to take over the party, and 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 shift politics in a different direction. You you can imagine that happening in France. Uh, you can you, you could imagine it in Italy. You're see, seeing it to some extent with Maloney. Um, it's very hard to imagine that in the UK. Um, we we we've never really, apart from the Civil War, we've 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 never conservatism has not ever had um a kind of reactionary spirit um the the you know uh thrown an altar and you know the kind of institutional fabric of the nation has largely been what it is and it's the conservative temperament is to is to conserve things as they are but when things have been hollowed out from from within as as is increasingly the case it's very very difficult to convince the conservative to become <laughs> to become a reactionary um at, at least here, I know that's that's different in France, for example. Yes, I think there's um, there's definitely um, you know a reactionary flavor to to something like Brexit, which was you know you could you could say that probably France would have had good reason to to do something like that as well in Italy, very good reason as well. Um, you know, Spain, Greece, there would have been some some good candidates for the exit, but the fact that the UK not only allowed the referendum and then also, I mean, allowed, probably <laughs> it didn't, it didn't pan out exactly as, as the, as the people would have wanted it. But, um, you know, there, there are some reactionary energies in, in the populace in the UK and they were activated at that point. 
um, there's it, it, it always feels to me like there's a lot of uh, power brewing, uh, but the you know the disconnect that you that you presented there between just the 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 entrenched uh, powers in the in the Tory Party and the fact that Tory Party is by by your definition conservative in the sense that they you know they're just doing liberalism uh, with the speed limit, <laughs> which is what what uh, a lot of, you know, they're just conserving the, the victories of liberalism, the, the liberalisms of yesterday. So, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're essentially doing what they promised to do. Um, but, yeah, there, there is, and there, there's also a very big distaste, I feel, in the UK for parties that are genuinely reactionary. Um, I mean, not, not to say, I don't know exactly all the details, but, you know, there, there were attempts at this. There was... The BNP also, you know, every time you open any sort of um, article about the BNP, it's 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 all about how they're Nazis. UKIP also all about how they're Nazis, um, and then what the Brexit Party also, they're also at least Nazi adjacent. So there, there there have been there's a ferment there, and people are trying to do this, but it seems like the making the jump from um, from that stage to actually exerting power. Um, doesn't really happen without the the blessing of the Tory party, at least. And the Tory party seems to be nowhere nowhere to be found. So um, I wonder, do, do you think that there's maybe a chance for, for reactionary energies to actually make their way to power without the Tory party? Or will the Tory party itself have to regenerate itself into something mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. Is, is more mm-hmm. reactionary? Mm-hmm. Well, it's a fascinating question. I mean, and you know, Brexit was in some sense a reactionary uh, moment, uh, but it was a, a moment of reaction that was profoundly conservative in the sense that it was trying to recover a the, the means for conserving our national sovereignty and returning, as it were, to the status quo ante of, you know, in, you know, in 1973, 1974. Um, and, but I think, you know, to your point, the the first past the post electoral system means that the re- the reality is that two parties dominate and will always dominate, almost certainly, um, British politics, uh, and it is also a, uh, a, a a platitude that the Conservative Party will never shift to the right if they haven't got uh, some threat to their right. And, and that happens very, very rarely. Um, we've seen it happen. We saw it happen with Brexit. However, we saw it, we saw UKIP get going in the 90s and their increasing electoral success in the European elections uh, and actually in the general election of, um, so I think was it was it 2015, they got nearly, I think, 4 million votes then. Um, the that electoral success, although it didn't translate into parliamentary seats, uh, uh, it, it has uh, it did have the effect of forcing the in-out referendum and and holding the the t- Tory feet to the fire. So I think there is a there's a there's a there's room for um, reactionary parties, as it were, on the right uh, on. Particular forcing particular issues, uh, particular policy changes. So it's not inconceivable that, as the sort of fis- fiscal pain and immiseration of net zero policies start to make themselves felt in the years ahead, it's not at all inconceivable that you get a kind of not zero party forming a little bit like the Gilets Jaunes in France, which would never get a parliamentary seat, but might get a million. 1.5 million uh, votes away from the governing party or the party most associated with net zero, and that could, in itself, I, that, you know, that that could bring about a meaningful policy shift. Um, what you're not going to see, however, is a party breaking through in the way that Macron's En Marche broke through, um, and and just completely sort of reshape. Um, the landscape of party politics in in the UK that that's not going to happen, um, and you know we can, we've never really had, um, of course, to the left. You know, everyone, uh, a, a, anyone to the right of uh, the, the the leader of the opposition is is far right, and you know, so UKIP is far right, and the Brexit Party is far right, the Tory Party is far right, um, but what's most sort of gratifying actually about the history of British politics is that 
the far right has never, ever really had any any meaningful prospect of electoral success or, or power uh, uh, ever, as far as I know. I mean, the BNP was a joke. I mean, I think most they had a couple of council seats. Um, they've never come close to scoring a significant, um, never come close to getting a, an MP in, into parliament. Um, and, uh, you know, and, that, and that's a good thing. Um, UKIP, to some extent, um, absorbed, you know, uh, uh, absorbed a lot of the energy on the right and did manage to redirect the Tory party on that particular issue. But, uh, but across a broad kind of suite of policies, it's very hard to see uh, a kind of major, m- major sort of shift, shift to the right um, being brought about by a, um, by a, a reactionary party opening up on, on, on the right. Um, we've seen in the, on the left certain, you know, some, some dynamics like this, you know, a few years ago with Corbyn, you had the momentum movement that really kept the, the Labour Party in a completely unelectable um, position. Uh, there's never really been anything quite like that on the right. Um, but, uh, but we'll see. I mean, I suspect if, if things continue in, in, in the way they are, you, you, could, you could well imagine um, new, new configurations opening up and, and um, threatening serious damage to, to, to the Tories. Do you think that um, any sort of uh, upheavals in, in neighboring France make uh, how how have those uh, affected British politics? Do you feel that that's um, you know because it, it does seem at least from from what I've been looking at that France is in, in, in good part on fire at the mm. moment, or at least was a few days ago. I haven't been been keeping up with the explosive uh, footage, but uh, yes, I mean. And and this is on the basis of issues that are probably more acute in France, but are on the same trajectory as mm. those that people reacted against with Brexit and are at the heart of the the at least the British right. So um, yes, I I wonder if that's uh, if you see any sort of impact from mm. that. Well, you know, we we have had riots of our own we have you know we, we back in 2011 there was a very very serious unrest in uh, in london uh but nothing like what you saw in france last week nothing like what you saw in france in in 2005 um and i i think that speaks to i generally speak i think it speaks to the uk's success in integrating a lot of its uh, as it were post colonial Migrant populations in in post the nineteen forty eight act, um, which you know, so in the in the fifties and sixties, we actually you know m- managed to integrate um, our uh, people from Commonwealth countries, former colonial countries, pretty successfully in a way that France has never quite managed to do, and you know the kind of the difficulties from Algeria and and Morocco still, you know, very much persisted. Um, you know, that said, perhaps we are also just, you know, one incautious uh, policeman's uh, uh, truncheon or, or gun away, um, away from uh, a significant, uh, a, you know, a moment that is similar to what we saw in, in France last week. It, it's uh, uh, I mean, I you know, structurally, we don't have the same kind of bidonville. You know, we don't have the kind of banlieue uh, ghettoizing, a uh, ghettoized problem to the same degree in in, in France. And uh, so, you know, I would hope that that nothing like that happened. But no, I think this is a question that every country in the West needs to face, apart from those that you know, very that very small handful of countries that have that have been. Uh, uh, that, that, that have effectively, you know, shut their borders or, or maintained very, very strict migration controls. I think Poland and Hungary, who, you know, they're not they're not really having to worry about these problems, as I think the Polish uh, prime minister or, or president boasted last week in a kind of, <laughs> I think I saw a, uh, you know, I saw a tweet sort of the, 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 the president, Polish president comparing uh, the aftermath, you know, the aftermath of the French riots with uh, uh, a lovely sort of, um, you know, sun-filled life in Poland. Um, and, uh, so, you know, it's certainly not impossible and the question of assimilation and, and integration has never really, has never really gone away and nor, 
do I think there's a perception that it's uh, certainly the last you know, 20, 25 years that it's been particularly successful. And part of the problem is that the standard elite narrative, of course, is one of self-repudiation of Britain's past, uh, uh, constant assertions of uh, Britain's uh, complicity in uh, uh, in moral horror and only in moral horror. And so, and, you know, one of the points that we were trying to make, uh, a number of speakers tried to make at NatCon was that you know, the more you, you denigrate the nation, um, the, the more you are laying down the conditions for um, a kind of uh, a civic strife and a sort of self-hatred that could, that could take a kind of uh, uh, a form that we saw in France last week. Yes, I th- that was partly also um, my message and in, in, in the speech uh, as well because as as someone who used to be an immigrant to to the UK, um, I, I really feel like people underestimate the impact that this type of discourse has on the immigrants. It doesn't it does not make them necessarily feel better about living in the UK. It instills a sense of paranoia. It instills a sense of of kind of being being hunted and observed, and um, you know it's 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 a it's it's a very corrosive type of thing, especially for people who like people coming from Eastern Europe. They they very much look up to the West. Uh, this this was the land of plenty. This is what we want to replicate in our countries back home. And um, when you arrive there, the fact that you know, denigrating the, 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 the local culture seems to be the, like the most high status thing to, to do. And you see the most, you know, the, the most educated, and interesting people you've ever met. And this is their spiel constantly, uh, you know, about colonialism and things like that. It's just, it's, it's either something that's very off-putting. Uh, it was very off-putting to me because I've, you know, I wasn't I wasn't easily shaken from my uh, from my anglophilia because I I had I had read about this these places before I got there, so it's uh, you know they they weren't necessarily telling me um, anything uh, anything new, uh, but yeah, it's um yeah it's 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 extremely corrosive, and uh, I feel like um, very misguided even for people who think this is uh you know this is a, a good idea to be. Mm-hmm. Um, to be, maybe they think this is being humble or, you know, there, there are many, many psychological, uh, probably uh, ideas that actually push people to, to think this mm. way. Um, but I do, I do think we're, we're slowly coming up on time. So I want to ask you the last question. This is the, the question of the show. Everyone gets this question. Uh, do you have a recommendation for, um, a subversive thinker who might be underrated or people might just do well to, to check out? Well, I do. I mean, I've got several, and I wasn't sure who, which which ones to pick. I mean, um, I mean, as I was saying earlier, the question of you know subversiveness in the UK context is is slightly different. I mean, particularly on the right, we don't do reaction and subversion quite as well as our European cousins. Um, that said, I do like to you know I like to treat myself to the, to, to some subver- subversive authors now and again. I mean, I huge fan of Ernst Junger. He must have been recommended a lot on your programming the glass bees and 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 uh forest passage and his war journals have just been translated they're definitely worth a read um and um but i but in terms of i'm just thinking of some thinking of some english subversive authors who are neglected and who are worth revisiting the two that came to mind one is um sir henry main who wrote a book called well a number of number of books important works but um his his popular government is excellent you could get it for a couple of dollars on on amazon um and you see in that book a lot of you know you some, something like you see a sort of foreshadowing of the elite theory school of of mosca and and um Mich- Michels and and pareto um and a, a sort of a deep uh foreboding at uh what 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 democracy uh, might bring and uh, what 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 happens, as it were, beneath the bonnet of democracy and the way in which um, elites can uh, can can corrupt uh, elites harnessed to a kind of popular will can can corrupt a nation beyond um, uh, you know it just you know, irreversibly. Uh, I, that's really worth uh, his his famous uh, thesis in that book is the uh, thesis that. Progressive societies bring about a shift from status to contract, 
um, and um, he he has one of the best criticisms of of the kind of social contract contractualist blank slate uh, kind of political philosophy that we we find in Rousseau and and Locke and and and, and others. Uh, so I'd really recommend Henry Maine, uh, Popular Government, and then second, if I may, can I have a second? Of course. Um, James Fitzjames Stephen, um, Liberty, Equality, Fraternity, a very uh, a very, very early response to uh, John Stuart Mill's On Liberty and uh, uh, he, he, some of the best criticisms of, um, of, of uh, effectively the sort of the, the, the French revolutionary uh, spirit and a kind of, you know, a, a very well-articulated cynicism um, about uh, uh, towards, you know, this sort of idea of, fraternity and these sort of abstract anemic ideals that no one really is going to want to live for and certainly no one will will die for um and uh, i think both of those figures are are are, are un, unduly neglected but are contained within them a sort of the, the seeds of a kind of national conservatism um that 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 uh, are, are well well worth sowing Excellent. Thank you. That's those are really good recommendations. We haven't had those before. I mean, we've had Ernst Jünger before, but like you said, this is this was to be expected. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for for coming on, um, for organizing NatCon, for having me at NatCon, which was a really wonderful experience. And is there any other place that you'd like people to uh, to check out? So maybe some work of yours or things that are upcoming. Well. Um if you'd like to get in touch, you can find my uh, find my details on my fac- faculty webpage. Uh, if you want to come and study here in Cambridge, uh, if you want to do some research in religion and theology, philosophy, political philosophy, write to me. I'm always always interested in taking on new research students. Uh, or if you're younger than that, if you're school age, come and uh, consider applying to Cambridge, whether you're, you're in the UK or not. I'm now on Twitter. Um, the NatCon team uh, forced me onto Twitter. I'm at JTW or OWR. Uh, so follow me if you like. And I, I don't tweet quite as much uh, as I maybe I ought to, but um, that's been a, a, a really a, a great way to step into the public square. Um, so yeah, uh, and if and if you want to, um, you can I, on my faculty webpage. You can look at all the things that I've been up to uh, in terms of um, publishing ideas and scholarship. And if you can bear to read any of that and would like to comment on it, um, uh, always, always like to hear from people. Um, so that, that would be, uh, that would, that would be the, those would be the places to start. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming on James. This has been a pleasure. Thank you.